All right. Um, new winter lagoons and one nitrogen fixer that's not a winter lagoon. Okay. Um, fava beans classically are our vegetable. It's one of my favorite vegetables. If you've never eaten them and are of Mediterranean descent, you may want to eat a very small amount the first time. There's a very rare, very rare allergy that you don't want to experience if you're allergic to it. If you're not a Mediterranean descent, don't worry about it. The other thing to know if you're going to eat them is to peel the inner husk off them. Otherwise, they're very coarse. You peel the inner husk off and they're an absolute gourmet delight. If you're growing them for a cover crop, you can let a little side go where you grow some to eat. But if you harvest all the beans, you're not going to get the nitrogen fixing. You'll still get a load of advantage from them because they have massive root systems and work the soil wonderfully. The Italians like to grow them and follow them with tomatoes. They think it makes the tomatoes more disease resistant. And special to them, and cow peas and vetch of the ones I'm talking about today that I know of, they have extra floral nectaries. Extra floral nectaries are pores at the base of the leaves, usually, where the plant exudes nectar as a bribe to beneficial insects to keep the aphids off them, to keep the bugs off them. So even in cool weather when things aren't flowering, you need to be feeding your beneficials and ramping them up so they're ready to do the work for you all season. Things like fava beans and vetch are feeding them. Now, cow peas will not be growing at that time of year, but in the summer, they'll be one more source of nectar. So that's a major advantage. Fava beans winter kill reliably at 10 degrees, and I've often found even earlier than that. They'll do better if they're mixed in with the grain because the grain will protect them. But if you're thinking you're going to, you want a green fava bean cover crop, you're probably not going to do it on a large scale in the mountains because they probably will winter kill. In a garden, row cover will probably be enough to carry them through. A key thing to understand about what causes winter kill and what doesn't cause winter kill is the fact that plants that are even half hardy have the ability to move water out of their cells right, and into their intercellular spaces as they're freezing. This means they don't rupture when they finally freeze solid. It also means that the water is not working as an igloo. The key thing that determines whether or not a plant successfully does that is how quickly they go from warm to cold. So if you put row cover over something like fava beans, it's no longer going to be hardy down to 10. It'll be hardy down to probably 10 below because it was able to get the water out of its thing. So the other side of this is you want to be sure that a cover crop dies during a warm period, you put a row cover over it, you maybe feed it some nitrogen so it grows and gets even more water in it. And then one, one really cold night, you open the poor guys up. <laughs> they go down. You know, you can probably guarantee that things like oats will die that way. Okay. Um, so, fava beans, great cover crop. It's not going to necessarily live if you don't pay, a, I mean, if you don't pay attention to protecting it somehow. I've heard of people just protecting it by having it surrounded by a tall grain. That was enough create a microclimate so it didn't freeze out. All right, fenugreek. Fenugreek is very expensive to buy. What's really great about it is it reliably will winter kill probably even before spring barley. And the source I know for it is Peaceful Valley Farm Supply. It's pricey, but it's small seed. If you're looking to have, Ron Morris has a technique where he plants, Ron Morris is, by the way, a professor emeritus at Virginia Tech. He was the original no-till scientist. He basically, taught America how to do no-till with Roundup. He's re re a, um, retired, fortunately for us, totally inspired by low-till organic. He's also doing huge stuff on beneficial insects. He likes to plant his beds, wide beds, in strips of grain where the, where the plants are not going to be placed, and then a lagoon right in the row where the plants will be placed. He still gets that symbiotic relationship, or maybe not symbiotic, synergistic relationship of always growing a grain and a lagoon together because the lagoon will make nitrogen for itself and if it has to compete with the grain, it has to make more nitrogen. And so it makes more nitrogen if it's going with the grain. That's why you always want to grow a grain with a lagoon. It's close enough to have these strips that the roots are still going to inter inter intermingle so he can still get that effect even though he'll have nothing but the lagoon which is going to make the most nitrogen right where he plants. And usually the lagoons are far easier to get to rot down because they're so succulent with the nitrogen. And then it's easier to plant in those strips. Fenugreek would be spectacular for this. If you grew spring, spring barley in strips in between and around where you're going to plant your plants, 
and then glue something like fenugreek down the strip, it'll winter kill and be totally gone by springtime. You can plant carrots in there. Now, something's going to make me wrong about that. It's going to be so cold that it never rots or something. But usually, with our climate, the, the fenugreek is gone. It's not one for biomass. But it'd be great for getting that nitrogen in there, suppressing the winter weeds, and then wiping out. So that's what's great about it. Okay. Um, when would you plant? Pardon? When, when would you plant? Once again, probably if you want the best effect, sometime in late August. But you can go, I went for, I've gone for it as late as late September, and it still did great. But these ones that are going to winter kill, in the, probably fenugreek is someplace in the, the high teens, maybe even low 20s. If you put them in too late, you're going to get nothing, you're not, it's not going to be worth the seed. So you want to give them enough time to grow. So I'd say probably the drop dead time for fenugreek is going to be sometime towards the end of September, and it's far better practice to get it in sooner. You usually don't want to put them in until you're after the dog days of summer, though. Okay. Um, lupin, I have it in there because I want to experiment with it, and I'll tell you more about it next year. Because Mary Jo Wanamaker from Wanamaker Seeds was here yesterday. You can look them up. They're a wonderful source for edamame seed, and lo and behold, they carry lupin. Lupin is a pretty gorgeous, wonderful plant. I'm sure it's got amazing root systems. I would be surprised if it didn't have extra floral nectaries just by its habit. And in Italy, they eat the seeds of some of them. I wouldn't eat any seed, but you know there are some that are used as a food. Um, it's also an excellent um, flower. Um, white sweet clover, I have never grown it. That's, that's similar to um, yellow sweet clover, but it's an annual. I just did my research for this class, learned that it's an annual, and it's not even necessarily super hardy, which means it might be a good one to grow with something like spring barley, hoping for a winter kill. But it's a very deep rooted cover crop. And that's its huge advantage, is that deep rootedness will pull up the, uh, the minerals. The last one, it's, it's not listed here, it's probably, oh, here it is. And I left it in for humor, and when I put it on, on the webpage, I should take it off, though. I do voice to text, and this is what they did with um, Facilia Tennessee to Folium. Facility at Tennessee Folium. Uh, um, voice to text can be a lot of fun sometimes if you're not in a hurry. Anyways, it's a pretty magical plant. In Europe, they grow acres and acres of it because they really love its exudates for building soil diversity. It's a wonderful bee forage plant, great flowers, lovely, in the borage, comfrey family. You know, if you know those plants, you know that they're really powerful plants. They have major effects on all kinds of things, our health, the soil, feeding insects. It's got a really nice um, furnished um, structure, which is why it's called Facilia tanacetifolium, tansy leaf facilia. And so as it dies, it's going to provide like areas for insects to hang out in, protection. It's not deeply hardy. It will winter kill. I can't tell you at what temperature. In a greenhouse, it won't. And it doesn't always winter kill. I've had it winter over, but not reliably at all. The final thing, the thing that I think is magical, is it's one of those plants that fixes nitrogen, and it's not the lagoon. So you get to have all the diversity. You know, legumes are they're one set of exudates. You know, it's kind of a family. It's going to do one kind of thing. This one is unto itself. You're, pretty, you're getting different interaction. Yeah. Facilia tanacea folia, tansy leaf facilia are fringed facilia. And if you're willing to buy 25 pounds, you'll get a wonderful price from Kaufman Seed. Look, think about cooperating, folks. Think about buying it together. Otherwise, instead of $247 plus shipping, $14, $12 or something a pound from Peaceful Valley Farm Supply. And why is it so expensive for them? Are they gouging you? No, it's called opportunity cost. They don't sell enough that it's worth keeping it in their, in their inventory without getting the money to make it worth it. You know, if you have low sales, the only way it's worth selling it is to get some money for it. So as we learn about it, it'll become more available. Okay. Um, that's basically the, the winter legumes that we don't usually grow. Okay. And they're very useful for different reasons, and I encourage you to, to play with those. Okay. For summer... Um, well, first, we'll probably quickly touch on some things that work in the winter, but you're not going to grow them unless they die, unless you don't, unless you don't want to use them early the next year. And those are the perennial and bi biennial covers, clovers, um, red clover, white clover, yellow sweet clover. All of these are perennials, but they're not hard to kill. But given the cost of the seed and how they function, I tend not to use them unless I cannot come up with crimson clover unless I plan on letting them be in for longer than a season. Like, you know, our, 
I say it's more half. We have, we have warm weather and cool weather cover crops. I tend not to grow these for just that half year at a time. I tend to have these in for three quarters of a year or more. And indeed, yellow sweet clover doesn't do the great deep mining unless it has enough time to develop and get its roots down there. But then if you do grow it, it mines the soil wonderfully. So I highly recommend it for that. Um, and then you, white clover, its main function to me is as a permanent cover crop in paths. If you want to have cover crop paths, it is the best one. Dutch clover or white clover because it stays low to the ground. If you mow it frequently, it will outcompete grass even. It does better being mowed than grass does. It's slightly invasive to the bed. You're going to have to knock it back out again. I know some people have said, well, you shouldn't recommend it because it invades the beds. It's just a whim. It's not that hard to keep up. You know, you can mulch the edges of the beds. It won't invade that much, and it's just easy to, to knock it back. But if you want to pay no attention and don't want it to take over a bed, then maybe you don't want to use it. You know? But I like it a whole lot for pathways. And, yeah. What's the difference between uh, the white clover and purple clover? Are they equally good? No, not for this. The purple clover um, is better for biomass and probably deeper rooted, I would imagine, by its top. It's the flowers that are used medicinally. Um, the white clover is superior for paths because it takes traffic well and stays low. So that's why you use the white clover. If I was going to have a cover crop in an area that I was going to leave in, in like pasture for a while, I would probably go with the red. Though I've heard the palatability is greater on white, I'm not really sure, I'm not an expert on that. So if you're using it for animal feed, you want to check that out and decide that. That's not my realm. Um, okay, all right. Remember to inoculate your legumes. Are the people who grow legumes here, are there any people that don't think it's important to inoculate? Um, are there people who don't inoculate because it's too hard to get the inoculant? I don't even know what that is. Okay, that's fine. That's good, I'm glad you don't know. Um, that's why I'm here. When you inoculate a legume, you're providing the rhizobia bacteria that the plant is growing a house for. If you pull up, and we'll see a picture, actually I might be able to have it pretty soon here. No, I'm going to wait because I'm not going to go on back. But anyways, I'll show you some pictures of nodules. They make nodules on their roots that are empty houses unless the bacteria are there to move in. If the bacteria move in, they pay rent. They fix nitrogen. The air is like 80 some percent nitrogen and plants can't use it. But the bacteria can and in trade for simple carbohydrates that the plants give to the bacteria, they make nitrogen for the plants. So the plants have more nitrogen. Now if they don't need nitrogen, they won't make it. So it's kind of silly to go ahead and do a heavy nitrogen feed and then inoculate your cover crop. You don't need that heavy nitrogen feed if you're inoculating your cover crop. And you may have that bacteria in the soil so you might not need it. But if you don't, then you're going to not get nearly as much nitrogen fixation as you will if you inoculate it. And it's just, it's best practice to always inoculate even if you've inoculated it before. You probably don't need it, but is it worth it given the cost of the inoculant to take the chance that you're not going to get maximum nitrogen fixation? So that's the reason to always inoculate. And know that it's not like you can buy garden combo and use it on everything. That's why I had this chart, which we can go and print for people that didn't get it. And if you're ordering from Coffin Seed, they always know. They'll tell you, you need cowpea inoculant for that. You need soybean inoculant for that. There are different inoculants for different plants. Seven Spring Farm Supplies carries an inoculant that covers far more plants than most. It's a mix of them, which really I wish they made more of those kinds of inoculants. Because you can buy one and inoculate many, many crops. Not everyone, but most of them. Okay, so that's inoculating. Please inoculate your plants. Um, and understand if your garden centers don't carry them, it's because not enough people buy them and they're dated. So if we buy them, we can get them to carry them, yes? Can you uh, describe the process used to inoculate? Yeah, it's easy. You slightly moisten, like a little bit of water at the bottom of the bucket, toss it around so they're damp, not wet, but damp, put the inoculant on. That's it. And if you see a few grains on each, each uh, seed, they're good. Don't inoculate days before. That gets wet starts to grow, then doesn't have the right conditions, you might have low viability, yes? Um, I've heard that some inoculants that are avail available at like common garden centers and stuff are 
They're starting to be uh, genetically engineered. Do you know if that's? I've not heard that, and we had a discussion on that yesterday. And somebody that gets certified said that she checked it out and hasn't had problems with that. That they're by and large okay. But I expect it to happen. I mean, that's the way they're going. Right. You know, and if you haven't weighed in on genetic engineering, please do. There's a big fight to stop genetically engineered salmon. Excuse me for going off topic, but we need to stop it. If we want to grow organically, we have to keep them from making a world where we can't. And they are doing it at a rapid rate, so it's a good point. Was there a question over here? Yeah, so um, that's actually a question I have as well. So you dampen it, like you get a bucket, put a little water in it, dampen the seeds, and you, you sprinkle the, um, the inoculant on the seeds? Shake it up. Look and see that there's a little bit on every seed, and you're ready to go. Shake it up with the, water, the damp seeds within the inoculant. Yeah. Okay. Not, don't have enough water that it's wet, or the inoculant floats off. It won't adhere. It needs right. to be just damp. Just the seeds damp, correct? Just damp. And if you want to be sure, use warm water and dissolve a little molasses in it. So they don't need to be like soaked in the inoculant or covered in it. They just need to have a few pieces on it. Yeah, just, just a little bit is all it takes, yeah. Um, there's, there's a whole lot of resolvia bacteria on each little grain. You know, It's not like one seed that needs to hit the radical of the plant. Um, Okay. All right, and the last thing I want to mention um, for winter cover crops before we get into summer cover crops is oil seed radish. This year we just did a new greenhouse. They messed up the pad. They didn't level it. We spent a lot of machinery hours on that pad where we're going to grow, fixing it and compacted the heck out of it. And so to be sure that it's a, a greenhouse worth using, first thing I'm doing for two thirds of it is growing a combination of rye, which is one of the best grains for going down deep and breaking the soil open. Facilia tanacetifolium, it's in the comfrey borage family. If you know those root systems, you know what they can do. Okay, and then oil seed radish. Oil seed radish can give you a radish that's like 18 inches long by three or four inches wide. You grow that, let it die, and bam, you just open up your soil that deep and deeper, because of course that's just the radish, the root's going down below that. So it's great for opening up the soil. The other thing about the radish is if you let a little bit of it bloom on the edges, huge beneficial nectarary. Lovely flowers, and indeed you can sell the flowers, you can sell the young pods even. The young pods will be edible and succulent. They get much older on that and they'll be hot and woody. But when they're young, you know, so there's many, and that's what I try to encourage you to think about is many of these things like the crimson clover are multifunctional. You grow your cover crop, you make a little money off it, you know? Only when you got the time, sometimes you got a crop that's making you more money. But if it's a slow time and you need something to take to market or sell to a restaurant, these things are extras that you can use. You know? Okay. Um, all right. All right. Um, okay. Let's see what I catch up here.